Thanks. Um, as Peter said, uh, Eli Scholar is meant to be an institutional repository of sorts. It's been in, I guess, what I would call a, a quiet uh, launch phase for about six months while we started to accumulate some content. Uh, and I'm not going to do a presentation so much as a very rapid demo of some of its features, because if you know where it is, uh, it is live. Um, first thing to know is what is the, the secret URL, which is not very secret. Eli Scholar, library, Yale.edu. I always love doing something live on a new computer. Yay, it's there. <laughs> well, it's mostly there. Um, Yep, there we go. Okay. Uh, as I said, it's been, a, it's been in a soft rollout phase for about the six, last six months. Uh, fairly soon, we're going to be going public with it uh, with a link on the, on the main library website. Uh, I think some special thanks are in order to Kelly Barrick at CSSSI uh, and uh, Charlie Greenberg at Medical, who among others have been uploading quite a bit of content as well as uh, helping uh, some, some people upload their own. Uh, Eli Scholar has two main functions as I see it. Um, one is as a publishing platform suitable for publishing out of print content as well as managing new content uh, such as journals and theses, uh, including some wet, uh, workflow and editorial controls. Uh, secondly, it's a self-publishing platform uh, for faculty, staff, and graduate students who would like to have a, a simple way of creating their own portfolio page and, and highlighting their own work. Uh, in terms of who uses it, uh, there's a large group of people using the BPress platform. Uh, among our peers, uh, Penn has a, has a large repository, and more locally, the uh, Yale School of Law has had their own version of it up running for uh, a number of years now, and have had uh, in the millions of downloads. So once you get a critical mass of content into a platform like this, uh, people really do come to it uh, and seek you out. Uh, and putting this in, in, I guess, in a slightly larger context, uh, since Peter was talking about some of the, the functions of, of uh, libraries in the digital age, uh, in terms of bringing digital resources and print resources together and, and, and creating a place where content is created, uh, this is a place to do something with that content. Uh, libraries have traditionally brought content from other places uh, and provided it to, to, to the students and scholars. Uh, but what happens to that student and scholar content? Well, it gets published in a variety of journals and sometimes, sometimes you can find it that way. It's not always easy to find it in one place. And particularly on the student side, uh, unless it's a dissertation and ends up in the well-known dissertation database at ProQuest, which we all know to find if we are in a library or an academic institution, that has access to it, uh, it's pretty hard to find the rest of that student work. Uh, and there's an awful lot of really good student work being done that's not necessarily at the PhD level. Um, so this is an opportunity to, to, for easily publishing student-run journals, um, student essay contests, uh, any academic department that decided to want to put uh, honors theses in. Uh, it's great for materials like that. So now I just want to quickly run through some examples of some of the content uh, that I think are good. Some examples of out of print content. Well, we'll click on this one since it's running through the slideshow anyway. Here we have the Nepal Studies Association newsletter, uh, which Mark Turin, who we'll be hearing from in a bit, uh, helped me upload. Um, so this is a, a newsletter um, dating, from 19, uh, dating to 1972. It's been out of print. We have uploaded all of those out of print issues. Um, they're here as PDFs, they're easy to find, and we've got a link to what it morphed into, which, which is the Himalayan Research Bulletin, which we don't host, but someone else does, but you can link to it from here and find it. One more example, um, and here I'll just I'll go, but go to the browse view. Yale Medical Theses. We have a lot of Yale Medical Theses. Many of them have now been entered in here. So we have theses and dissertations from 1952, to 1992, there are a lot more that are going in, uh, but the point is these can now be found. Um, they've existed in print, um, they've existed in a rather hard to find digital system at the Yale School of Medicine library, uh, but now we're getting into, get them into a system that uh, is crawled by Google, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and is associated with other Yale content. So again, out of print content being made accessible. We also have things that are existing in print, but it's nice to have a digital version as well. The Yale School of Nursing Alumni Newsletters has a nice series, 2003, going back 1999, 2002, and on. And again, we've got the nice print cover here. You can see what the print edition looks like, but you can also download it and see a digital version. Another type of content this is very useful for is conferences. We have one conference up, uh, Yale Day of Data. Um, you can see information about the conference. You can actually browse the conference. 
You can see who's participating in the conference. Uh, you can see the schedule of events for the conference, if you want to see one of these nice schedules. Um, you can also see the poster submissions, and you can submit posters. This actually takes you to where you can submit a poster. So if you're planning a conference, you can manage the submission process. And then you can also go straight to the poster itself. I haven't clicked on this one, but hopefully it works. Uh, so here we have metadata about the poster, who created the poster, and if you click over here, you can download the poster, which I won't do because it might take a little more time than I want to spend right now. Uh, so I'm trying to be quick here. So that's an example not only of content being presented and managed, um, but managing the production of content. Um, that's something that if we tried to build ourselves, it would be rather difficult, which is one reason we went uh, with a solution like Digital Commons for B-Press because the workflows are built in. Um, we have several early adopter e-journal uh, candidates that we're working with now, so we'll be bringing some journals online uh, where they will be using the whole workflow process where the editorial board of the journal gets trained, they can solicit submissions, manage submissions, manage the peer review process, and then publish the electronic journal. Uh, they can also do a print journal at the same time if they like, but this manages the whole process soup to nuts. The second big piece that we have, which we have not done much to publicize yet, is the portfolio piece, which they call selected works. And if you look in here, you will see that we have some enterprising people who already have selected works pages. Some of these existed before we even signed up for a Yale subscription because you can create your own uh, on the BPress site. But if your email address happens to be yale.edu, uh, now that we have a license, you get a, a branded version of your page. What that also means is if you have a page and you leave Yale, you take it with you. It's portable. It's not a portfolio that only lasts while you're here, which is why we think it might be nice for graduate students uh, if we want to start rolling it out for them. And just, to, just to go to oops, a random example, actually we'll do the first example. This is someone who had a pre-existing site apparently. When we turned it on, boom, he got populated into the, uh, into the Yale site. And uh, Professor Ayers has a lot of writings on here. He's got them organized in his own way. There's antitrust writings, civil rights writings, contracts, corporations, empirical, popular press. Um, the faculty member, our, our student, our staff, uh, has control over what kind of categories they want to organize their work in. Typically, this is used for preprints and postprints, but you can put anything you want in here, uh, assuming you have the rights to it. And we have some verbiage on the site about, you know, I really should know what you're putting up and have a, have a copyright to it. And you can put a profile picture up. You can put a join my mailing list, follow me, so you get, you know, like, uh, automatically notified when something new gets added to my page. You can put your own links in here. He has some websites that he decided to link to. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, uh, if you have one of these pages, you get statistics sent to you, uh, saying how many downloads are you getting, who's downloading your work, uh, which is a very nice thing to have. Uh, which gets me to the last thing I wanted to mention. Um, statistics are great. Uh, if, you, if you have a series in here, you're the series owner, you get statistics on who's been downloading things from your series. Uh, whether it's a journal or a collection of papers or whatever. If you're an individual author, you get statistics on how many of your copies have been downloaded and looked at. Um, but one of the nice things about this is it's all extremely searchable. Uh, I ran a few random Google searches this morning. I'm going to try one again or two here just to show you how it works. Um, let's pick up something like, this is from the medical theses library, follicular lymphoma. If I did that just by itself, I would get thousands and thousands of Google hits. Um, but if I happen to know that somebody did something at Yale about it, and try follicular lymphoma Yale, ah, there it is. It's the fifth item down here. There's an item in our repository showing up on Google. And there's the little cover page it generates, and it takes you right into their medical thesis. Another quick example. Let's try that Nepal newsletter. Once again, I will put in Yale because I tried doing just Nepal newsletter and there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of Nepal newsletters that show up. But if you happen to know Yale might have something to do with it, it shows up number one and two and three and four. It's really, almost the, sometimes you'll get the main issue page, sometimes you get individual issues. You get multiple hits. Uh, but the point is these things get ranked very high in Google searches. Uh, if you have any kind of keyword search uh, that's close to something that's in here, and particularly if you happen to know it's associated with Yale and add Yale as a keyword, it's going to take you right to the collection, often right to a particular work uh, within a collection that you're interested in. Uh, I'll do one more just because this is the newest, the newest bit of content that got uploaded. Cole Porter, critical edition. Kiss me, Kate. 
Let's see if this will work without adding Yale. Uh, it might, we'll see. Mm, didn't quite make it into the top page. It did when I did it earlier. We'll try adding Yale to that. There it is, number two. So music library has just added the critical edition notes to Kiss Me Kate. It's a very large PDF file, so I won't try to click on it and download it. Um, but the, uh, the, the Cole Porter people who created the print version of the critical edition are very happy about this uh, addition to it. Um, so that's a very quick overview of what Eli Scholar can do and some of the kinds of materials we can put in it. Uh, and I've got a, a few minutes left for questions. All right. Thank you very much, Michael.